Thank you so much. And your name? E. E. I think I've met you before. I know you. I know your work, maybe. Yes. It's very nice to see you. And thank you for being here. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. You mean, yeah, go over there? Yeah. No problem. I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Too many it's okay. And, yeah. Can I put the camera in front of me? Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. If you could kindly turn your cell phones off, we'll begin shortly. Thank you. Welcome to the American Islamic College Lecture Series Program. Tonight we have with us a most distinguished guest, Sister Layla Mohammed. Um, she will be speaking tonight on civil rights, a shared human experience. There is a sign-in sheet that will be going around. Paulina, she'll be passing them around. If you could kindly just sign in, give your email addresses, so that uh, Sister Muhammad can remember this uh, today. Sister Layla Muhammad was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, during the time her father, Imam W.D. Muhammad, Malcolm X, and other ministers under the leadership of the Honorary Elijah Muhammad were spreading the social reforming message of the Nation of Islam. She and her parents moved to Chicago just a few years later. Leila is a graduate of the University of Islam, Sister Clara Muhammad School, and now works with other educators within that school system. She holds a degree in child development and is very dedicated to the education of children. Leila works within the interfaith and intrafaith community as a community organizer and activist. Her work has been and is because of her love and concern for our human family. She was one of eight Muslim American leaders to visit Auschwitz Nazi concentration camps and met with Holocaust survivors to promote interreligious dialogue and understanding and denounce anti-Semitism. Layla is founder and executive director of Ash Shamsia, the Umbrella Family Service, established for the purposes of helping families in need. She is a published author. She has a new spoken word CD out as well. Please let's give a warm welcome to Sister Layla Muhammad. With God's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. Peace be unto you. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Thank you very much to the American Islamic College for this opportunity. And thank you all that are here attending for your attendance and for your ear. As our sister uh, stated, we're going to be talking about civil rights as shared human experience. And it is my prayer that we all gain benefit from this talk. And if we do, the good that comes from this talk comes from God, the Most High. And if I make some mistakes, those come from myself, and I ask God's forgiveness and for your understanding. 
civil rights a shared human experience. Some 52 years ago, I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the end of the 50s and moving into the 60s, the time of civil rights and the movement of civil rights in the United States. My father and my leader, Imam W. Dean Muhammad, Brother L. Haj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X, and other leaders were teaching the social reforming message of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Nation of Islam. As it was given to him, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, by his teacher, W.D. Farad. And the story of W.D. Farad is a story of mystery. There are conversations about who he was, where he came from. Um, we'll just say for now that he was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teacher. He was Muslim, as we know Islam, as, as it is in the Quran. But he was somewhat of a psychologist. And he taught a psychology that was very much seeded with El Islam. And this is what they were spreading at that time to African Americans and to others, because many others listened besides African Americans. This reforming message, as I said, sprinkled with seeds of El Islam. They were taught to read the Quran. They were taught that the Quran was the best and the pure revelation. They were taught not to eat pork, to fast the month of Ramadan, and to greet their brothers and sisters in peace. as salam alaykum. Many other things were, were there in those messages for seekers of truth, salvation, freedom, justice, and equality. And the members of the Nation of Islam were taught ju just that, to seek truth, to study, to examine. Imam Muhammad began to teach different from the doctrine of the Nation of Islam in Philadelphia even before he was in prison due to his conscientious objection to the war. After he was released, he says that he had no more questions. He understood the truth of the Quran and of El Islam. And as the history goes, he was put out of the Nation of Islam twice. And the year after, his last return in 1974, he was unanimously voted as leader after his father's passing. And the reason for him being excommunicated, put out, etc., was because he did start to teach different. He was, he was no longer teaching the psychological reforming message of the Nation of Islam, but he was teaching Islam as the world religion that was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, prayers and peace be upon him, in the 1400s. Our brother Malcolm had questions about the teachings also. And he spoke to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad about his questions. Brother Malcolm's instructions were to talk to Minister Wallace, as Imam Muhammad was then called. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, talk to Minister Wallace, my son, when you have these questions. And Brother Malcolm did just that. His brother minister advised him with these words. Those teachings that you question, don't teach them. Imam Muhammad said he had questions too, and he followed his own advice. Imam Muhammad had a teacher and a friend at the time by the name of Muhammad Abdullah. He taught him mainstream Islam beliefs and practices, one of them being to call the prayer and recite the opening chapter of the Quran in the newborn child's ear. And this is what my father did when I was born, and that was my beginning. From that beginning, I feel that those words were in my soul and in my subconscious. And from then until now, my guidance has been the Quran. 
I have experienced many of the similar incidences that people in the civil rights ex movement experience of prejudice uh, for myself and witnessed it happening to others. And a few years ago, I wrote this poem and presented it for African American History Month to the clerk of the circuit court. Humbly laugh, I won first prize. I will share it with you. It's called Colors. Many colors. Black, brown, green, and blue. The eyes of me and you. Created with perfection by our Lord the Most High. Our eyes, our skin, our individuality. Different, yes. Different like our skin, different like our faith different like our past, different like our future, different like our life. But we bleed, we feel, we see, we think. We smell the stench of racism. For if we could only look into the eyes, black, brown, green, and blue, we would see the souls colorless, me and you. As I said earlier, the words of the Quran were put in, my, in me by, at birth. These words have been my guide and will always be. God says in the Quran that the oppressed is worse, to oppress is worse than slaughter. He also says he taught Adam all the names. We have all we need to be free and to free others and to all live our best life on this earth in peace. With everyone reaching his or her human excellence, God has given us this. We just have to talk to each other, dialogue, have faith and believe and most importantly, work towards good. This is what the peaceful cries of the oppressed know. They know that they must take themselves out of oppression. Somewhere in their subconscious, even if it is not conscious to them, they know when they are being treated wrong. And when one knows that they are being treated wrong, we speak out, we cry, we question, and when we are disrespected and ignored, we make a moving sound. This is what our sister, our sister Rosa Parks did. She made a choice to sit in her seat as her right as a hard working human being. The movement began. Dr. King, Reverend Ralph Abernathy, Stokey Carmichael, Andrew Young, Reverend Jesse Jackson, and so many students, men, women, and children made a moving sound. We are grateful for their sacrifice and their hard work that benefited humanity. Many of these individuals were in conversation and working with other people that, we, that were not so visible in the movement. People like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Dr. King and others in the movement met with the Nation of Islam leader and one, and one has even referred to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as his father. They respected each other. They dialogued and they worked for this movement towards the good of humanity. As we know, many whites, many Jews, were a great part of the movement. And this is what it takes for a movement. It takes the collective whole working in their particular places, working quietly, working loud, working behind the scenes, working in front of the scenes, but all working together collectively towards that common good. We all have read or remember the horrible day, May 3rd, 1963, Birmingham, 
Alabama. The dogs and the water hoses turned on our brothers and sisters, our human family. I remember sitting in front of our television, and I see my mother over there, and I was sitting with her on 67th, either Dante, I'm not really sure which one, but I remember it very well. And I remember fe being fearful. I did not necessarily understand everything that was going on because I was a child, a young child. But however, I did know who looked like me and who did not look like me. And I could see what was happening to me and who looked like me. Everyone in and out of the United States saw this too. The attention was brought on our unfortunate, ugly past. America is beautiful, but as Imam Muhammad said, there is America the ugly. The human collective concern took notice, and we praise God, for we wouldn't be sitting here today like this if that hadn't happened. I'd like to mention a gentleman that was an African-American business person at that time that I'm sure you've read about, Mr. A.G. Gaston. He was from Alabama, and he owned a hotel, owned a hotel. He was in the hotel business. He was on the telephone speaking with his attorney when the incident happened, and he told his attorney that he had to end the call. He saw the dogs and the hoses being put on his people. And it's reported that he said, my interest in the civil rights movement wasn't so much helping myself. It was helping the other fellow so we could all survive. It wasn't a selfish movement. It was for all of us. This says it all. The movement was for all. He could have very well said, well, I'm safe in my hotel. I own this hotel. Let them take care of their business. But he did not. He listened to his conscious mind that I'm a human being, and those are my brothers and sisters, and I must get involved. This movement was a selfish movement. This says it all, the movement was, all, was for all, excuse me. And it has been compared to the South African movement against apartheid. It has also been said that the silence and the disrespect of Jim Crow laws and forced segregation was equal to the Holocaust. Again, God says in the Quran, oppression is worse than slaughter. When we, as one human family, sees our brothers and our sisters working to free themselves from oppression, we absolutely must help. God says to go towards all that is good as if in a race. We must, we must get in the race so that we all can have collective peace, freedom, justice, and equality. And this is what is happening. God is so merciful. The technology and the knowledge of man growing, we can see, and our young people can see our students on Facebook and all the social media when something is happening overseas in Egypt, etc. They can see, and you don't have to take a side. You just have to be empathetic because that's another human being and see what you can do to help. And if all you can do is just pray, then that's the biggest thing, pray. But look in yourself and see what you would want that person to do for you if you were in need of help. May 3rd is engraved in my mind because I saw children like myself being treated in such a way that I knew not even an animal should be treated.
So now, when I hear someone call, call me a nigga because it's been done. And when I, when I hear or when someone says to me, okay, sweetie, I know it is very condescending and there's nothing sweet about it. They're just saying that I have a little mind. I remember what our prophet Muhammad, the prayers and peace be upon him, said. His words, he said, hurt no one so that no one may hurt you. And he said, none of you will have faith until he wishes for his brother what he likes for himself. So when those ugly words or those ugly attitudes are being placed upon me, I don't strike back with another ugly word. I just keep working. I just get with other people with like minds and keep moving. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, rise up, you mighty black man. Rise up, you mighty nation. Now he was speaking specifically to the black man, but we know that many others heard him. And now we're living in a time where we don't have obvious oppression. We have somewhat unobvious oppression. And it has no favors. You can be purple and it can still touch you. We have oppressions, lack of health insurance, lack of health care. We have oppressions, uh, immigrants, Latinos, that have lived here being forced out of here. We have oppression of unequal education. We have oppression of I have worked 20, 30 years on a job and now goodbye without any hesitation. So oppression has no favorites. So I really believe that Mr. Muhammad's words were for this nation, were for the world. Rise up, stand up, and get yourself out of oppression, collectively. Imam Muhammad said, we are believers by choice. And I had a conversation one time with a young lady that told me, oh, I don't believe in God. She said, I believe in the goodness of, uh, of people. And so I said, okay, I, I believe in that too. We're believers. <laughs> And that's for us to ponder upon. So Imam Muhammad said, we are believers by choice and God and good by nature. And he also said to us not long before he passed, he was talking to us as members of his association, but he was heard over the world also. And his words were, we cannot stop now. And that's what I feel every time January comes around and we observe Dr. King's birthday. I think, don't talk about the past in the movement. We cannot stop now. We have to keep moving. Because if we stop moving, what happens? Movement is death. Non-movement is death. And I don't think any of us want to die until we accept it. But we don't want to die. So let's keep moving. We cannot stop now. For the oppressed, the time, as I was just saying, is in the moment. The time to move is now. We, as a concerned human family, must know that civil rights is a shared experience. We all have witnessed or have been oppressed. Feel for your brother and your sister. Join right-minded people with common concerns and move towards the greater good. I personally work with Muslims, Christians, and Jews, and others of other faiths and beliefs. One that stands out very much to me, and I didn't know they would be here, but Lady Kiara, may God be pleased with her, her movement, the Focolori, and some of her people are here, my brothers and sisters. They're, it's a Christian movement, and if you don't know of it, I, I suggest that you Google 
and learn about this beautiful movement. Imam Muhammad introduced that community to us. And he was somewhat of a psychologist himself. He wanted his African-American ex-slaves to be friends and to love what used to be our slave owners. And for many of us, it was a strange thing. But then it became so comfortable and so, so very nice. Over the years, Lady Kiara and Imam Muhammad held events, dialogued, large events with thousands of people in D.C., small, intimate events throughout the country, like maybe a third the size of this, from that extreme. And then we became one. We're a family. We're friends. I literally have told my children, if I'm not here and you can't find our family, they know where the Focolori house is in Hat Park. I said, go there. And I meant it from the bottom of my heart. And that's a powerful thing. Because before the folk of Lori, I'll be honest, Allah forgive me, but I was uh, not so comfortable with being in intimate settings with Caucasians. Because I still had the ghost of slavery on my back. I also have had the opportunity to work with the Jewish community. And a dear friend of Imam Muhammad, and now I'm pleased to say a friend of mine, Rabbi Jack Bimparad, put together a delegation to go to the concentration camps. And at first, I was like, well, I don't know whether I want to do this. <laughs> and um, I really couldn't think of a reason why other than fear or being uncomfortable or being accused of taking a political stance. And then I said to myself that God says in the Quran that he made us different, not so that we should despise each other, but that so we should get to know each other. So I said, that's why I'm going to go, so I can get to know more about the Jewish members of our human family. And so I went, and it was an eye-opening experience. We went through the chambers, and at the end, there was a book to sign. And I put in the book that I had a parallel feeling similar to the feeling that I had when I had been at a janaza for one of my family members. And it was the truth. I became so connected with what had happened there when I saw this one exhibit that had knitted or, or crocheted sweaters and little booties for babies. And it was countless of them that had been taken off of those children who were put into the constant, I mean, to the gas chambers. And there were brothers, imams, crying. Of course, I was crying, because I've made many blankets, because my mother taught me how to crochet. And I know the love that goes into that, and it's because you love that person, that child that's going to be wrapped in that blanket. And to know that those blankets were taken off of those children and they were killed in such an inhumane way, I will never forget that exhibit. And I suggest that we don't criticize the Jews in this instance in reference to them continuously telling us of their loss, having documentation. I suggest that we join them in doing the same for our circumstances, that we record our loss, that we document our loss just as they have. Because it is our fault when someone doesn't understand because we didn't write it down. Again, I say, God says that he made us different not to despise one another but to get to know each other. And God speaks the truth, and we should hear it, and we should act upon it. I feel as though perhaps many of you 
I am speaking to the choir, as they say, because I recognize many of the people that I dialogue with. But we should be reminded also to push harder, to bring in those who may not be a part of this interfaith or interbelieving world or conversation and have simple things, some coffee, some tea, a bite to eat, take a trip to the zoo with, every, with children and just talk and just get to know each other. Because when we get to know each other, we see that we are not so different. And unfortunately, when we hear of devastating, inhumane things, we better stop and think that that was a human being and something was in them or got in them that could have got in us. And for our God's mercy, that could have been us. So we need to get to know each other and be kind to each other. I'll close with Dr. King's letter to the eight clergymen that said, I'm sorry, to the eight clergymen that said to him that the demonstration was unwise and untimely. Dr. King said, when you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, when your middle name becomes boy, no matter how old you are, and your last name becomes John, as in John Doe, doesn't even matter. And when your wife and your mother are never giving the respected title of Mrs., when you are hurried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, or as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, a so-called Negro, living constantly at a tip talk stance, never quite knowing what to expect and played with inter inner fears and outer resentment. When you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. Dr. King, even after being advised by African-American businessmen and clergy of his own faith, they said, just go home, leave Alabama, just wait on this. He said, I don't know how I'm going to pay to get the people out of jail. I don't know what I'm going to do. But he stepped out on faith, as we say, and he moved. And that's what we all believers should do. We have made a choice to be believers. We cannot stop now. Thank you. And now we will open up for questions, God willing. Assalamu alaikum. comments is fine too. <laughs> well, I, I, um, I don't know what to say. All of these people, we, oh, I see a question. Talk a little bit more about what your awareness is of the connections between uh, 
Malcolm X, you know, the fact that he visited you know, your grandfather and could you just elaborate a little bit more on that? I think there's a lot of riches in there. Yes. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Well, um, yes, as I stated, uh, Dr. King and many other civil rights leaders, they um, visited the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's house and they were in dialogue. And um, what I've been told by family members and other uh, leaders in our association is that part of the reason that we made it through this journey was that it was well known uh, the discipline and the fearlessness of the Nation of Islam. Uh, uh, the, those uh, who have seen the movie, uh, Malcolm X, and if you haven't, you can see it. Uh, of course, it's a movie, but there's a lot of truth there. And the incident that was there where the brothers lined up where to put with the police, that was common knowledge that the non-weapon carrying uh, Nation of Islam soldiers, men and women, were prepared to die. Uh, back in the 1930s, we started a school system, and the truant officers arrested men and women, took their children from them, and our believers, our members, spent time in the penitentiary because they said that no longer with the Caucasian uh, who was not concerned whether the development of their children be their in children's instructors. So we know if they would go to, go to jail for education of their children, what would they do if Dr. King said, okay, my brother Elijah, I need your people. So that was the silent uh, knowledge that our government understood. And our government has always been wise. You don't make it to the top not being wise. But we also had founding fathers that created the Constitution that also read the Quran and the Bible that understood human dignity and knew that it was time. And so that took place. Um, there are many other stories. Um, I, I, I don't want to say them because, all of them because I might get some of the particulars wrong. But one story that comes to mind is that um, there was a bombing down south, and everything was, just, was destroyed on that block except for the temple because they knew not to touch it. So this was known. Now, my belief is that it wasn't that we had such muscle-bound, fearless people. They had Allah, even though they may not have understood Allah the way we do. But they knew that there was something higher than them, and they called that higher power Allah. And I believe that Allah protected them. And I believe that Allah whispered in the ears of the shaitan, the devil, and those who were listening to the devil, that you better watch out. Because Dr. King might ask for his friends, his brothers and sisters, to help him. So hopefully I answered that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, first off, let me just say, hey, your talk brings back a lot of memories. Because I, I, um, I'm associated with I'm 50 years, born in 1953. So I remember seeing those scenes on TV of, you know, the demonstrations of Birmingham and the you know, the, the Southern police can beat up the demonstrators and all that stuff. And my, my parents were involved some in the civil rights movement in Chicago. And so as a kid, um, I guess I always thought that, you know, because of what I felt was the success of that movement, that it would make progress for the better world, which in some ways it is. But in some ways, when I look at politics today, I'm kind of disappointed. So. I just kind of wonder how you feel. So you were a kid, you went through this, Ho hopefully you think there's a lot of successful things that came out of it, but now we're kind of stuck where we are, as if we still have to keep fighting. Well, I feel the same. I'm sure, because we get disappointed, and there are many times when I do feel disappointed. But your last statement is that was that it seems as though we have to keep fighting. Well, I have come to the understanding 
that I shouldn't look for the day when I don't have to fight, that I shouldn't look for the day when I don't have to struggle. Because in our holy book, and I'm sure it's probably in the Bible and Torah, but God says that he's going to give you a task, and for you, after you have mastered that task, to prepare yourself for the next one. And it's just that simple. I think that some disappointing things are happening now, but I think that we just have to keep struggling and keep moving. And um, that's just life, you know? My daddy says, such is life. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I was talking to my children not too long ago. We were talking about um, I felt that in many instances, I didn't do as much as I should have uh, regarding the civil rights movement itself. But I was a young mother, and I had young children at home. But when I thought about it in retrospect, and many people here will feel, I think, feel the same way. In many ways, I really was a part of that struggle, simply by living in Chicago. Uh, every job I took, it seems like I was the first. You had to be twice as good, work twice as hard, get less money, but I knew that if I hung in there, it would pave the way for someone else to get a position. And so I thought about this. I, started, I said, you know, I really did do something to help make the struggle easier for people coming behind me. And um, the, just the other comment I want to make is that at, uh, I went to a King function, and I think the overwhelming um, consensus was we have to stay out of that comfort zone. You've got to be able to take the high road, especially when there is an issue of moral conflict. You can't sit by silently. And I think we have reached a point, or are reaching a point in our society where people are doing that. They're saying it's okay. institutionalized sin is okay. Well, that's just the way it is but we can no longer be accepting of that kind of philosophy in order to make our world function and to take care of those who need to be taken care of. In my observation of the modern day Willie Lynch theory, it seems that We still have women against men, young against old, whites against black, but we have uh, indigenous Muslims against immigrant Muslims, and that bothers me. Uh, the idea of all the African Americans being centered in the city, of, in, the, in the center of the city. Now being pushed into the suburbs, and those people who were in the suburbs have come back to the city. And places like that, uh, say, Levitt and Madison, <clears throat> the rent is so high, you can't pay the rent for what had been skid up. You know, but we don't speak these words. We don't talk about what's happening. We don't talk about the assault against teachers. You know. Teachers were very hard, and um, the sacrifice that they make to trying to get the children up to where they should be, you know, is it doesn't seem to be any continuity there, and no one is speaking out against what's happened in the modern day times. Any comments? You want to call me a comment? I used to say any comments. I'm thinking she might want some. Of I mean, I didn't, I didn't just say Sister Rob, you know. I know Sister Rob very well. I respect her. She uh, taught my siblings. I, I, I believe I was working in the school, our school system when she was. And you're right, you know. Um, these are our modern oppressions. And we have to speak out. I, I can... Uh, I feel personal about the teacher situation because I've taught. And to be honest, I have no desire to be in a classroom because 
I don't want to put my life on the line like that. And it's just that simple. You know, um, the public school system is, is not a nice place. <laughs> and um, I'm sure that there are some wonderful schools, but it's too much killing going on in and around our public schools. Um, and it's just, it's, it's just a lost of, uh, I think um, our young people do not value life because they see life leave so easily and so quickly. I also think they don't value life because we, as the parents, don't celebrate life. We um, have traditions in our communities, akikas, et cetera, by mitzvahs, but we should have, just in general, a celebration of life. We should not say, well, here comes another baby. Uh, can you afford to take care of that baby, et cetera? We want the children to value life. We should celebrate life. That's one thing I, I believe. And another thing that you said in reference to the um, debate and unfair treatment between the indigenous and immigrant Muslims, it's a fact. It's um, an embarrassment, <laughs> but, but it's a fact. Oh, no, people talk about it. I've been in conversations with people for about eight years, and probably it's been going on before I knew about it. We talk about it, but then it seems to be that there's other pressing issues that end up overshadowing that. But um, all we can do is just try and get with people that have like concerns. You know, I, I, my, my main, and I'm not in those conversations anymore because I personally feel that where I'm supposed to be is to help women and their families with issues of health like domestic violence, mental health, cancer, et cetera. And um, so that's what I do along with interfaith dialogues because I believe very much that you can't help anybody with any issue without the faith, without the belief of God, and without the belief of the oneness of humanity. So I just think we just have to find our niche, and if it's just two of us, then move with it, you know, because it's a lot of oppression going on. I'd like to comment on something you mentioned about the uh, relationship between indigenous and immigrant Muslims. It's really not the talk that we need to do, it's the do that we, what we need to do. Yes, sir. Uh, I live in Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, my good friend is Yahya Turkan. Mm -hmm. He is uh, an African American. And we really have this kind of uh, family affair between my wife and his wife and his children. I have six children, he has seven children. So it's this kind of uh, uh, relationship, that's what we need to build on yes. between the immigrant Muslims and the indigenous Muslims. Uh, I would like to ask you to uh, uh, comment or elaborate on the, <coughs> the need for education. Uh, as, you, as you know, Sister Clara Muhammad was a devout uh, educator that uh, even the, the, the state asked her to, to leave the, the school that she was teaching, and she refused to do that. She wants to teach uh, the children proper Islamic uh, education or the proper. Uh, so what is the, the role that we need to do to teach our children or the general public about the Muslim roles in the civil movement? I think that um, we should where Islam compels you to be involved. And I think that we should not, necess not, so, not be so strict upon saying, well, this is my stand, and I mean talking to your child, and this is their stand, and so this is where we are. I think that we should just teach our children to empathize with struggle and to educate themselves about other people's struggles as well as their own. And then to act and move upon an opinion of knowledge. So that's what I think. Alhamdulillah. Wa alaikum as I want to thank you for coming and giving us such a wonderful presentation. Alhamdulillah. Um, it's a really good subject, and I'm, I'm struggling really hard on what I want to do, because what, what the sister said, sitting over here, 
about about the teachers, you know, about how how our educators struggle. That 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 is so true. And then the comment that the sister made about indigenous and also um, um, our immigrant Muslim population that's been a big concern of mine um, for a long time as an as an African American Muslim within an immigrant Muslim community. Mm -hmm. um, and the way I see it is that it's not a lot of us to tell our story. Like when you made the comment earlier that if it's not written down, you know, as you were saying, in, in regards to the Holocaust and things like that, if it's not written down. And I really think the largest dis disadvantage, sister, is that a lot of people, they don't know our story. We, we know our story. We know our history as African Americans, but, but because it's such a painful history, we don't even talk about it amongst ourselves. And then we assume that others automatically understand, well, every single group that has immigrated to this country back, back from way, 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 Staten Island, et cetera, every single group that has immigrated here, they come with their own concerns and issues, and they're really not ready to take on ours yet. You know, so it, I, I really think it takes time, and I think it takes more of us to explain our particular circumstance, you know, and, and, and that way others can understand because you know how we say if you really want the story, you have to get it from the horse's mouth? Mm -hmm. And it's really hard for, for a lot of people to understand the, the, the subconscious or the psyche of an African American, of, of those of us, like you said, we still carry the ghost of the slave on our back. It's really hard for people to understand that, and we don't talk about it. So, so I've taken the responsibility to, to speak of it, you know, when, whenever it comes up, to, to try to explain, um, to explain what it's like. And that brings me to something else, I'm sorry. Um, I, I really think uh, it, it comes up a, a lot, very, very often. Our struggle through the civil rights movement, um, right now, for the last 10 years, post 9-11, it's parallel the struggle of, of the immigrant Muslims, you know, and I think that it was very shocking because we had become accustomed as African Americans to being treated in a certain way. And we know it, we smell it, you walk in the room, you can feel it, you know all of that. So it really wasn't a surprise to be discriminated against as a Muslim because <laughs> we've already lived it as a black person. So I think that, that there's a lot there's a lot that we can teach mm -hmm. immigrants, irregardless of their religious uh, background, of what it's like to be treated badly because you look different. You know, so so we actually carry a really big message with, within ourselves to to kind of fill that circle through through interfaith, uh, intercultural, interracial, through just about every single circle. I, I think we've had a lot of experience in that as as African. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I'm very glad you mentioned that because um, it was so funny after 9 11. It was like a few days after, and I had a trip to make. My At that time, I was working for Cook County Child Support, and they were really, very sincerely saying, Don't go. Da -da -da. And I told them, I said, Don't go. Why not? I said, I've been through this before. <laughs> I know what to do, how to act, and I just went. And I, you know, and you're right. We have to share with our brothers and sisters because we share their pain. But we do have a knowledge of how to get through it. We're an example of how to get through it. I personally think African Americans have done wonderful. We had no uh, post traumatic stress treatment or, or uh, uh, process. We just were made free and then that was it. And the same thing for the, the slave owners. They lost their property and that was it. So I think that we have all done a very good job. It's, it hasn't been that long. Now that I'm 52, I know how time can fly. And, and, and years, <laughs> years, they move. And you really can't do a whole lot in a decade or two decades or even three or four. So I think that we've done well. But I think that we shouldn't pat ourselves on the back too much. Because like I said before to my brother here, it's disappointing 
but it's the struggle. It's just the life, and we just have to move and work together in that movement. So. Thank you. I hope I have a 